Michael Barber is on, so he must have solved his computer problems. Congratulations, Mike. <laughs> Thank you. A little stressful. <laughs> so good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Mullen, chair of the Green Mountain Care Board, and I'm going to call this morning's uh, meeting to order. We're going to dispense with uh, any uh, executive director's reports or discussion of minutes or old or new business for this morning and save that for this afternoon's meeting. The sole purpose of uh, this morning is really um, the collaborative uh, surgery centers uh, certificate of need application. And so for the purposes of this hearing, I'm going to designate Michael Barber as the hearing officer and turn the meeting over to Mike. OK, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this is a hearing in docket number GMCB-008-21 CON in re collaborative the Collaborative Surgery Center. Uh, the hearing is being held pursuant to 18 BSA 9440-D2 and Green Mountain Care Board Rule 4.407. As the chair said, my name is Michael Barber. I'll be the hearing officer. Um, Representing the applicant today is Alexander LaRosa of MSK Attorneys. And representing the uh, Office of the Healthcare Advocate. I'm sorry, I am I the only one that he froze on? This is the reporter. No, he froze for us too. No, okay. frozen all of us. Okay. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> Mike, we'll give you a couple of seconds. If not, uh, Laura, are you prepared to uh, fill in as hearing officer if Mike uh, continues to have computer problems? Certainly. Okay, let's give it a minute and see what happens. <laughs> um, Mr. Chair, this is Susan Barrett. He is in our state office, I believe, so I the internet should be fine, and I know someone is there to assist him, but I just texted him um, just to give you that update. If anybody's just joined us, uh, we're in a little bit of a technical difficulty. We're trying to see if our hearing officer can get back online, and if not, we'll proceed uh, without him. So I just got a text from Mike, and uh, he said probably the safest thing to do is turn the meeting over to Laura. So I'm hereby appointing Laura Bellavo as the hearing officer. Good morning, okay. Laura. Good morning. I am back. Can you guys hear me? We yes. can. OK, I I don't know what just happened. I'm sorry. <laughs> you want to want me to keep going or you want Laura? I'll send the uh, appointment I just made and uh, revert <laughs> back to hearing officer Mike Barber. It's turning okay. into a three stooges skit here. <laughs> yeah, I, I apologize. I'm having some computer issues this morning, it seems. Um, so I think I was, I don't know where I lost you guys or I froze, but um, uh, I was this just. This is the court I think reporter. You just introduced. Uh, um, oh, go ahead. You have it right there, Kim. Yes, you were introducing the healthcare advocate. 
Okay. And I had a question. I I see Kylie and Sam Peach. Um, who's who's representing the healthcare advocate today? It'll be Sam Peach. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the schedule for this morning will be uh, as follows. First, we're going to hear a brief presentation from the applicant. Uh, then the Office of the Healthcare Advocate will have an opportunity to ask questions. Then board members will have an opportunity to ask questions. Then we're going to take a short break. Um, after the break, the applicant will have an opportunity to provide additional information if they think that's necessary uh, following the questioning. And uh, once we've finished with that, we're going to move on to public comment, and then I'm going to turn the meeting back over to the chair to uh, adjourn. So uh, in addition to the comments that it receives at the end of the hearing, the board will accept public comments on this application for 10 days uh, from today. So through Monday, February 7th. And with that, are there any questions or issues that either party feels we need to address before we get started? Okay, not hearing anything. I'll turn it over to you, uh, Mr. LaRosa. Thank you. Good morning. Appreciate the board's time on this yet again freezing morning. And I am here with a number of really uh, exceptional individuals to present the Collaborative Surgery Center's Certificate of Need application to this board. And we've structured our presentation today to highlight what we think is uh, worth repeating. Obviously, there's been a fair amount of filing both in the certificate of need application that was filed and in responses to this board's four sets of questions that uh, you board members all have. And as a board member myself, there's nothing I like less than having things repeated to me that are already in writing. So we've really tried to tailor it and highlight what we think is critical to discuss this morning with the board. I'm joined by Susan Ridzen, uh, Elizabeth Hunt, and both are founding members of the CSC. They are very excited to present this woman-led uh, initiative into healthcare to the board. I'm also joined by Amy Cooper. Amy Cooper is a manager consultant. She's not a member of the CSC, but she's been engaged based on her experience running a uh, other ambulatory surgery center to help guide the development of this project. We've got a short PowerPoint presentation for you. It's maybe, what, 15 slides or so that we're going to run through. Susan's going to run through that to begin. Uh, we've structured it in a bit of an informal manner. We we have uh, both Susan and Liz have experience and expertise in overlapping, but also in distinct areas. And so as necessary to expedite, expedite the presentation, uh, they may be both sort of jumping in and commenting on slides. Of course, you're welcome to ask questions at any time. Uh, they're happy to answer any questions the board may have. And, uh, you know, with that, I guess let's just get started with our PowerPoint. If the board has any introductory questions it wants us to address, uh, we're happy to take those. But as it is, I guess, uh, Michael, how does this work? Do we, I use the term drive, each, do, do you want us to screen share the presentation? Do you want to go through it? How do you want to do that? Um, I. If you can, um, if you have that uh, ability to take control of the the screen and share the slides, I think that'd be easiest. Okay, Susan, do you want me to run and you can just say next slide, or how do you want to do it? Uh, you know, I'm fine driving. Okay, so you can go ahead and do that then. Yeah, I have Mr. to. Mr. Hearing that. Officer. Yeah, I will. Um, yes, Mr. Chair. I, I, you remind me to swear in the witnesses. I assume. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yeah, I remember. Um, um, pause for just one second, please. Um, AJ, if you would drive, that would be great. I'm having some like uh, privacy notices come up that I don't want to deal with. <laughs> OK, let me pull it up. OK, thank you. Sorry about that. Not a problem. 
Mr. Barber, do you want to do that or? Yeah, while you're pulling up the, the slides, I would like to swear in um, Ms. Cooper, uh, Ms. Ridson and Ms. Hunt. Um, so if you could please raise your right hand. I'm going to do it too, just in case. OK, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you'll give today will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. I did not hear Ms. Cooper or Ms. Hunt's response. This is the reporter. Ms. Cooper, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you, I do. Okay, and Ms. Hunt? <clears throat> you're muted also, sorry. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I had the wrong version open. Give me one second. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna try to get this to work. Can you all see that? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. All right. So without further ado, I'll press on. So here, just a couple of things for the court reporter. You may hear me use some abbreviations. ASC stands for Ambulatory Surgery Center, and CSC is the Collaborative Surgery Center. And as AJ said, we're joined here with Susan, uh, with Elizabeth and Amy. Sorry, was there a question? OK, next slide. AJ. Oh, yeah, sorry, froze. There you go. <laughs> so why does Vermont need the Collaborative Surgery Center? Uh, we believe the most salient reasons are to help decrease the long wait times that patients are currently experiencing as well as improve access to lower cost sites of care here in Vermont, um, which we think there's not enough of. ASC, um, excuse me, if someone is typing. Um, yeah, there's mute. some background noise. <clears throat> Thank you. The other thing about ASCs is costs are knowable in advance, so patients will get estimates of how much their procedure is expected to cost prior to surgery, which is um, a huge benefit in the healthcare space. ASCs are less expensive, on average about 50% less expensive than getting the same procedure at a hospital outpatient department. ASCs are very high quality centers. They score well in quality measures. They have low infection rates. There's very high patient satisfaction as well as surgeon satisfaction with ASCs. Such centers um, help bring physicians into the state, um, surgeons and nurses. We believe the CSC will do that. This is definitely a labor of love for the, um, our team. Um, we all have day jobs. Liz is 30 weeks pregnant, um, and, uh, but we're committed. We want to really help improve the healthcare environment in Vermont. Um, and we're taking that a step further by uh, pledging to commit 50% of the center's profits to help support underserved areas in the healthcare space, such as primary care, mental health, and so forth. This project's very much in alignment with the triple aim of healthcare reform and healthcare reform in general. And last but certainly not least, the CSC will help to diversify Vermont's healthcare system. 
um, so that Vermonters have more options for care. I and mean, we're in a hospital centric system that essentially forces patients to go to a hospital and pay high hospital prices for care that doesn't need to be done in a hospital. Um, the other thing that um, having a diversified system is helpful for is you have redundancies in the system and it's in making it more resilient so that when a pandemic comes along or a cyber attack and takes down you know the local hospital um, people still have a choice of where to uh, get a surgical procedure if needed next slide so uh, briefly what is an ASC basically these are modern healthcare facilities that provide same-day surgical services um, services are offered are both preventive and diagnostic in, in nature. These are highly regulated um, centers or facilities. Um, they conform to state federal um, regulations. And in the case of the Collaborative Surgery Center, we'll also per pursue accreditation with the Joint Commission. Um, as I stated, these are very high quality options for care and they are, are rated um, very highly by both patients and surgeons. And ASCs aren't new. They've been re reimbursed by Medicare since 1982, um, but their numbers have grown. There's almost 6,000 now uh, throughout the country. And a lot of that is just due to technological advances in medicine. We have faster acting um, anesthetics, less invasive um, procedures. So, um, it, and so more and more surgeries are mi migrating to an outpatient setting. And that makes a lot of sense because you know, you're know um, you right sizing the location of the care to be in line with the acuity and needs of the patient. Um, and last but certainly not least, because these centers are so efficient and well uh, run typically, they save money, uh, cost people a lot less to get a procedure done in an ASC versus a hospital outpatient department. And um, they have saved millions of dollars um, to patients, uh, payers, and just the healthcare system in general. Next Susan, slide. Yes. This is Amy, if I may just add um, a point. I think um, you said it on the first slide, but I think really a lot of the motivation for this project is just helping to position Vermont's healthcare system better for the future. Um, there are some major trends in healthcare delivery that we highlighted in the application with more surgeries moving towards the outpatient setting, um, which ASCs are well situated to address and help meet that future need. We also have seen um, you know, an aging population in Vermont. That's going to continue with that trend, one of the oldest states in the country. Um, and this, um, they will require more outpatient surgeries. Um, and this is really a uh, cost effective and efficient way to provide those. Um, and additionally, we have had, um, you know, a real burst of population growth in Chittenden County. Um, so looking five years ahead, 10 years ahead, um, this project is really about helping to position Vermont to have, um, you know, the best healthcare system it can in the future. So I just wanted to make sure that that's underscored as part of the motivations. Thank you, Amy. Next slide, AJ. Great segue um, to this slide. Um, to Amy's point, um, ASCs are definitely helpful to address some of the issues that she mentioned. Unfortunately, Vermonters lack access to these more affordable sites of care where uh, Vermont ranks 50th out of 50 states for the number of ASCs per capita. You'll see that New Hampshire has 28, Maine has 15, we only have two. Um, and most states with populations the size of ours have roughly 17 ASCs um, for their residents to choose from. So not only, so we're, Vermont is already behind the curve and we don't, and we lack surgical programs in the state. And we expect that to only get worse as Amy was mentioning, um, more and more procedures are moving to the outpatient um, space. We have an aging population. We have a growing population in Chittenden County. All these factors um, will combine to increase demand uh, for outpatient surgical space even more than it is today. Next slide. So 
So um, one of the ma major reason that um, we believe the CSC is needed is just the long wait times that have been a long-standing pro problem. This has been reported on as early as January 2017. Uh, Green Mountain Care Board has reports that um, confirm long, longer than desired wait times in different specialties such as urology, um, ENT. Um, you'll see um, some a spokesman from UVMMC said it would take 175 days to see an ENT doctor. Um, just for comparison's sake, uh, if you look at um, the UK's national health system, they designate um, 18 weeks or just a little bit over four months as the maximum wait time for non-urgent consultant-led surgeries. Um, so if, if Vermonters are having to wait, you know, over five months just to see a ENT doctor, let alone get a surgery, we're you know well beyond what you know uh, what might be considered. Uh, normal or acceptable for wait times. Next slide. So long wait times aren't without harm. It's not just an inconvenience for patients. There are worse outcomes and higher mortality rates for pa patients across a broad spectrum of diseases. You have slow growing cancers that continue to grow. Um, people might be faced with chronic pain and, um, you know, could potentially become addicted or abuse opioids to manage that pain. Folks get depressed. Um, and in fact, the really sad story in the Seven Days article talked about a woman who was incontinent due to a bowel obstruction, tried desperately to be seen at um, UVMMC, was told that she was going to have to wait three months. And she wrote in her notes that it was, she was in miserable misery and that this was no way to die and she committed suicide because she was in um, such distress. And so these are real world um, issues. Um, and some people, you know, can't work because of their condition needing um, attention. And so you have everything that goes along with that, um, unemployment, financial hardship, disability, um, and just increased costs in managing a condition longer than it might need to be managed. No. Yeah, and Susan, if I may just add in here as well, um, we, you know, experienced this um, at uh, our business last year where we had surgical tech out of work for six months, um, had uh, a car accident and injured her shoulder, um, but then was several months until could was able to see a physician's assistant. Um, and then after that had to have a scan. And then after that um, for surgery, ended up getting the surgery after being out for five months, but would come in um, and see her coworkers and talk about um, the mental health impact of the isolation that she was experiencing being out and not able to work. Um, the painkillers that she um, was on in order to manage the pain eventually got the surgery after um, five months uh, with some help from other physicians um, calling to get her in in an adequate time. Um, and it turned out that she had a little piece of um, cartilage or bone that had chipped off and was floating around in her in her shoulder. That was taken out after surgery and she was back to we work within two weeks um, as and is feeling healthier than ever. So had there not been such a long wait time before the surgery, you know, that whole episode could have lasted a month or two and avoided the sort of um, extra problems that Susan talks about on this slide, the isolation, the loneliness, the pain medications, um, if we could only somehow increase the access um, to the surgeons. So CSC will help help get patients quicker access. Okay, next slide, you're, you're good. All right, so um, care at ASCs is more affordable, and this is an important consideration in light of our high health care costs that continue to grow at an unsustainable rate. Vermont spent six and a half billion dollars in health care in 2019, and that constituted over 19 percent of the state's gross product. Um, and we have, frankly, some of the highest health care costs in the nation. Um, here in Vermont, despite a very healthy population. 
So it makes sense to take advantage of the lower cost that can be realized by utilizing ASCs. And this chart demonstrates that. On the left hand side, you'll see a number of procedures that we expect would be um, performed at the CSC. And the second column is the rate that Medicare would pay an ASC. And then in the column next to that is the rate that Medicare would pay to a hospital outpatient department. And you'll see that the savings is significant, anywhere from 29% to 66% savings. And a lot of that is due just because ASCs are more efficient operations. They don't cost as much to run as a hospital outpatient department. Um, so there's you know, good reason to take advantage of that. The other thing to keep in mind um, with this chart is only shows the difference in the um, reimbursement rate for the different codes, hospital outpatient departments as well as inpatient um, settings. They are permitted to charge for ancillaries, things like time spent in recovery, medications, gauze, um, and other things, whereas ASCs cannot legally charge for those items, everything's bundled in the code and reimbursement rate that they receive. So the savings is likely to be more. Um, so this really makes care more affordable to a larger part of the population. And these prices will be available to all patients, including those with Medicare, or Medicaid, commercial insurance, um, as well as self-pay patients. So. Um, we should take advantage of that as Vermonters. And Susan, if I can add in there, um, just again, reinforcing the affordability here and that when we're referencing that these are the codes, um, this is strictly for the facility fee that is charged. Um, this doesn't include, as Susan mentioned, the ancillary charges such as time and medication. I personally have done um, a couple analysis of um, procedures that friends and family and myself have had um, comparing an HOP and hospital outpatient department um, procedure compared to an ASC procedure. And the savings um, shown here again is for the facility fee, but I was incredibly surprised about the savings that comes from not being able to charge for the ancillary charges um, in the ASC setting. It does add up and unfortunately it's very hard to materialize because each site of care um, and incident of care is different, of course, for medication and needs. Um, but I think it's important to highlight um, that we are not able in an ASC to do that. And it kind of moves in the way of healthcare reform in the bundled payment of it's a single um, charge for one um, instance of care. And again, just bouncing back to the triple aim, I think that this, um, this fee schedule and the ability to clearly state prior to a procedure how much a patient will be willing to pay based on their insurance plan benefits um, is right in line with the triple aim of reducing per capita cost of health care, improving the experience of care. No patient wants to walk into um, uh, a procedure not knowing what their bill is going to look like at the end of the day. Um, and that's something that we'll get to further on in the slideshow, but it is something that we're very passionate about at CSC um, to ensure that there is no surprise billing and that patients are aware of what their cost of care is going to be. Um, once their healing is done and they're getting anything in the mail. Um, and then, of course, again, just to highlight the triple aim is um, this is all improving the health of populations by getting patients seen faster. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, thank you. So and we actually have real world data um, in the example of the Green Mountain Surgery Center and the Vermont Eye Laser Center in terms of the savings that um, Vermonters realized through these centers. So this is from uh, the Green Mountain Care Board's annual report, which I'm sure all the board members recognize. Um, on the left-hand column, you'll see um, all the state's um, facilities, hospitals and uh, ambulatory surgery centers, minus two uh, that were excluded for data reasons. And um, the charge that each facility um, charges for different procedures. And in all cases, the ASCs, are less expensive for um, than the other option in Chittenden County, which is UVMMC, um, which is where the Green Mountain Surgery Center is located and where the CSC will be located. Um, also, um, the Ambulatory Surgery Center is also among the lowest cost option relative to the cost at hospitals outside of Chittenden County. 
Next slide, please. So drilling down a bit more, um, that average savings of $2,000 per case, it can be annualized to over $5,000, or I mean $5 million um, per year or um, for the year of 2019 when the Greenmount Surgery Center opened. So just orient, orienting you to this chart, you'll see that hospital average price, which is basically the average price uh, that we saw on the previous slide of all the hospitals in the state compared to the Green Mountain Surgery Center price. And you'll see um, the statewide average compared to the ASC uh, results in a savings of 39 to 52%. Um, but if you look closely or drill down to the Chittenden County, which is where the CSC will be and where the Green Mountain Surgery Center is, the savings is even more dramatic, 35 to uh, 70%. And that's that's real money um, in an individual's uh, pocket, basically, um, especially if somebody has a high deductible plan and they have to pay this money out of pocket, $2,000 is a lot of savings for them. Um, and this is a lot of savings um, for Vermont too, and this only reflects commercial pa patients, savings to commercial pa patients in one year. It does not include the savings accrued to Medicare or Medicaid. Next slide, please. So um, as Liz mentioned earlier, um, we will be providing patients with estimates of what their care, we expect their care to cost prior to surgery. We'll post all our prices on our website. We're really committed to price transparency and it will be individualized according to the patient's insurance status, as you can see here. We and, can, um, yep, go ahead. Sorry, Susan, I was just gonna add in um, regarding the patient estimates, as I mentioned um, just before, um, this is something that, as Susan said, is something that's very important to us to ensure price transparency within the healthcare setting. We think in the ASC setting that this is something that's very um, doable and um, it doesn't create any sort of administrative burden or anything due to the size of our planned facility. And one of the big benefits of doing this is um, we are talking about if, if a CON is issued of having um, a policy in place that we make sure that all estimates are sent within two weeks of the procedure, longer if possible, we would then rerun the patient's benefits. So what you're looking at on the screen is a mock of an actual procedure that could be done. And we use a clearinghouse system that allows the patient's real-time benefits to pull in. So if a patient were to call and say, I got this benefit, but you know, I had another procedure, I had an ER visit, <clears throat> we would be able to give them a real-time cost. It would literally generate within 30 seconds. Um, and we would have the ability to work with them that if, as Susan mentioned, there's a high deductible plan that would allow a patient to say, look, I can't pay a $2,000 um, outpatient fee right now. Um, in our various policies that we submitted to the board, um, one of them is um, payment plan policy that would result in zero interest payment plans. So we would work with the patient to ensure that it's a payment plan that's affordable to them. Um, we don't ever want the issue of payment to deter someone from receiving the surgeries that they are in need of. Um, and then of course, if there is a payment plan issue or they're saying there's just no way I can pay that, um, we have a comprehensive financial assistance application that we would send out to the patient that would allow them to, um, <clears throat> based on, um, base their income um, on the poverty level in the state of Vermont um, compared to the national level. And that would allow us again to make sure that the patient can be seen at the right time without any delay in care of their surgery date. Thank you. All right, um, an important consideration of the CSC or, or unique feature that we think is really valuable is just the unique environment that an ASC will offer um, to Vermont's healthcare workforce. These are lean and efficient operations. They need to be in order to stay in business. Um, so they are really uh, fast paced, um, close knit, um, tight working environment that's really employee driven. Um, I know this 
um, the CSC team will work very hard to make sure the environment is very positive and just inclusive of the um, employees' ideas to improve just the flow and care. There's minimal bureaucracy at an ASC, um, which is just a nicer place to work for some people. Some people want to work in a large institution, some don't. Um, so it's nice to be able to offer them that balance. Another huge um, perk to some is the, that you don't have to work nights or weekends or holidays. So you have more work-life balance and it tends to work really well um, with, for, with, for workers with families and small children and things like that. And there's also plenty of opportunities for cross-training. You don't need to spend years to move around and do different positions. And um, Liz and Amy can tell you about um, you know, Green Mountain Surgery Center employees who've done just that and um, moved around and really expanded their skill set. Yeah, Susan, I actually, I have quite a few examples that um, I'm currently the operations manager at Green Mountain Surgery Center. And um, I have multiple examples that in our short um, time here since opening in July 2019. Just some examples, we've had a receptionist. Um, we helped her get into nursing school. I personally wrote her a letter of recommendations. So she is now at Vermont Technical College pursuing a nursing degree. Um, we had a nurse who moved here from out of state and she was raising her family and took time off and she asked if she could get some clinical hours through our facility to get her Vermont state licensure back, which we happily helped her with. Um, and that did not, um, we did not require her to continue working with us. In fact, she's now working in the public school um, district, but we wanted to help her by way of letting her get her licensure back. Um, we have a receptionist that was trained into a technician role, so she has worked up in her career rank. She's very quite happy and one of our um, a very, very valuable employee here. Um, we have a medical assistant who's currently training into a scrub tech role, um, and that's uh, medical assistant is more people that help patients get in and out of bed, clean stretchers, um, insert IVs. Scrub tech is in the OR actually assisting setting up of procedures and um, working in a sterile environment, different level of um, responsibility, and she's doing fantastic. Um, we have a technician who um, is currently training through a structured education system that we are um, covering in full for her to become a first assist. So that works directly in, um, hand in hand with a surgeon to assist um, in things such as laparoscopic cases and things like that. So we have sent her off to training and we are supporting her fully in her education there. Um, and then we have um, multiple business office staff who came on board here and um, I personally am working on getting them into different management skills in order to progress in their own personal career as well. Um, again, as Susan said, working in a small ASC is a different healthcare working environment for both clinical and non-clinical staff. Prior to working at Green Mountain Surgery Center, I worked clinically um, both in first person experience um, within the healthcare system in Vermont. And then I worked outside of it as a vendor. Um, and I do know the different environments you work in do impact your day-to-day -day life balance. Um, and I have seen just what a positive impact working in an ASC in our environment really can do to a person and then retain a lot of employees. Next slide. So we believe that those features of an ASC will help to recruit and retain um, valuable healthcare workers in Vermont. Um, first of all, we we believe that our women focused and our women led and strong community focused organization will actually attract workers by itself. Um, this is important to uh, workers today. What their employers are doing for their communities, and we are firmly committed to our community. Um, the CS, another CSC in the area or ASC in the area will give Vermont workers more choices. Um, as I stated before, not everyone wants to work in a large institution and that's fine. Some do, but many don't. Um, so it could help, it will, we believe it'll help recruit workers to Vermont and keep them here. Um, having another ASC in the area will also help to lessen the monopsony power um, that's in the labor market that often exists in a consolidated system, which some would argue we have here. For those who are not familiar, a monopsony is when a large buyer controls the market and can set 
wages for area workers who have few or no other choices to work in the area. Um, and this can lead to you know, job dissatisfaction. In fact, there was a recent um, commentary by Richard Davis that talked about nurses feel, who work in large organizations or uh, hospitals, they feel sort of institutional servitude. Um, and um, the CSC will, will not have that kind of environment. We will treat the staff um, in a way that we want them to treat the patients. So with lots of caring and um, so they you know, pay that forward, so to speak. And um, the, another CSC, as uh, the Green Mountain Surgery Center demonstrated, will help attract more independent surgeons to the area. Um, you know, a American Medical Association survey showed that 66% uh, of subspecialists are actually independent physicians. And we do have a shortage of some surgeons and some specialties here in Vermont. So attracting them um, with the Collaborative Surgery Center will help Vermont um, with you know, having more surgeons in needed areas. Susan, if I may add just a few examples there. Um, it's very common for um, physicians to be married to each other. They're in medical school together and um, uh, residency and all of that. And there are several examples um, just in the last few years where a physician couple moves to Vermont. One of the physicians works for the academic medical center. One of the physicians um, is in private practice and operates at the surgery center. Um, we have examples of this in um, general surgery, um, attracted a general surgeon and a gerontologist, um, a physician who focuses on the process of aging. One of them works at the hospital. The other works in independent practice, utilizes the surgery center. We have um, recently um, had a gastroenterologist in independent practice um, married to a pain management specialist, another um, really um, area where there's an acute need for more surgeons there. Um, one of them works at the hospital. One of them works in independent practice. Um, and um, a couple of other examples, we fully expect that um, CSC will help us recruit new independent surgeons to the state, but also help the hospitals fill their needs with surgeons that they need as well. So it's a, it's a very complex process recruiting physicians to the state and having those options, as Susan talked about, for different um, physicians to practice in different ways at the same time, we think is really critical to helping Vermont um, attract and retain the kind of medical workforce that we want. Especially when you consider they that the physicians have these options in every other state in um, larger numbers, we need to be able to compete with that. I think too to add to that, um, when it comes to staffing of the ASC itself, um, Governor Scott most recently addressed this about we need to retain employees, not just in healthcare but in the entire work workforce within Vermont. Um, again, it's it's having those options for our healthcare professionals, our administrative professionals to seek um, a working environment outside of the standard practice um, within Vermont, which is in um, a hospital setting. And we have examples of that currently at Green Mountain Surgery Center, where we've had multiple nurses who um, well, actually went to nursing school at University of Vermont or Vermont Technical College, sought work elsewhere um, outside of the state because they wanted to be in the ASC environment and have since moved back with their families, spouses, and partners um, to seek employment here, which then of course brought in their spouse or partner um, to work in the workforce of other sectors within Vermont and their children into our daycare and school system. So again, it's creating that option for people to um, make a decision for their career um, and not be forced out of our state borders, which we know is very important right now and how the state is trying to figure out ways to retain people of working age um, in Vermont. Next slide. Then of course we have the Collaborative Community Foundation. That's our commitment to um, funnel 50% of the 
uh, center surgery centers profits to associated charitable foundations that would support things such as primary care, mental health, child counseling services, and just general health care reform efforts. And the way that we uh, envision this happening is we will make grants available to health care uh, related organizations throughout Vermont. We're really excited about this feature of our project. Next slide. Here's some key stats. Our project will cost just under 5.3 million location. Uh, we are seeking an unrestricted multi-specialty license with a minimum of four core procedure types, as you see there. And it will serve the Northern Vermont area primarily, but also um, counties in New York um, and Central Vermont as well. Next slide. And this is the last slide, um, just showing that the Collaborative Surgery Center does have broad community support. People would like more options for their care and more affordable options, and we believe the CSC will provide that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So next we'll move to questions from the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, Mr. Peisch. Thanks Sorry. so much. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Um, uh, just for the record, uh, my name is Sam Peisch. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a health policy analyst at the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, also known as the HCA. Um, so I just want to say good morning. Um, thank you, Chair Mullen, members of the board. I don't believe I've had the opportunity to say welcome, Member Walsh. Great to have you literally and figuratively on board. Um, so specifically, the HCA has comments solely on three points, and we'd love to hear from the um, CSC as well. Of course, um, they're on the proposal to donate 50% of profits commitment, which we just heard about. The, their patient financial assistance policies and making the case for requiring implicit bias training for staff and leadership at the CSC. So on the first point, we want to recognize that the CSC is proposing donating 50% of its profits to support the community, which is obviously a substantial commitment. And the HCA recommends that the board require the Collaborative Surgery Center to report to the board on the use of their donations for the sake of transparency and to ensure that the money is being spent as described. Um, so the first question is area for the CSA in this regard, it'd be good to know what criteria you plan to use in determining how these monies are going to be distributed to support community health, as you stated in the application and today. And we'd also be curious to hear how you arrived at this policy rather than an alternative such as charging lower prices for patients. That's our first comment. Any question? So who on wants to take that? So I can uh, start out and just say that um, as far as how we will identify the needs, we anticipate looking at several sources. Um, we would, there's community health needs assessments. Um, there are different regulatory and legislative reports that talk about different uh, areas in healthcare, um, areas of need. Um, we would speak to, you know, uh, area patients, area surgeons, area primary care physicians, um, but we do anticipate doing it in some sort of structured way. Yeah, Susan, I'll just add to that. You know, we have talked about um, the doing maybe a grant sort of um, program for organizations who are focused on the key areas that we've identified the primary care um, mental health counseling services um, health first itself when i was there which susan now runs was the beneficiary of the sim grant program and really enabled um, that organization to be involved in health reform and connected to a lot of the other organizations working on improving healthcare in Vermont. Um, so the one idea that we have talked about is um, structuring some sort of similar grant program, obviously on a much smaller scale, but to have organizations with ideas about um, innovating and improving services um, that relate particularly to primary care, which is an area um, that has really always been um, a um, challenge to try and figure out how to get enough 
and the right kind of funds to support um, primary care so that we can continue with population health um, and with the goals of providing more care at the preventative early stages rather than later on when it's um, conditions are more advanced and it's more expensive. So I think um, those, these are all conversations that we've had about how this foundation um, will function. Um, so these, um, these ideas are, are all on the table. Liz, do you have anything to add on that? No, I was um, just in that, that it would be most likely in the form of grants um, and that, you know, CSC, the foundation itself is not yet formed, but we did mention in our application um, that the CSC foundation would be a separate entity within um, the actual structure of the business, meaning that um, the board members for the medical portion side of Collaborative Surgery Center would not be those that are running the foundation side. Um, just to make sure that there is no conflict of interest in where the money should go. Um, and I think that that's important to highlight. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, on the second point, it'd be great to hear a bit more about the development of your patient financial assistance policy. Probably comes as no surprise given at the HDA this is something that's important to us. Um, it's our position that we think it would be useful um, and beneficial for the CSC to be required to have a patient financial system policy that aligns with UVM medical centers, given that they both operate or would operate, assuming the, um, in the same service area. And the level of generosity of financial assistance policies at smaller hospitals does vary significantly. But we think that the standardization would provide a more level playing field. So I'd be, I'm just curious to hear your response to that position and hear a bit more about how you developed your patient financial assistance policy. Sure, Sam, I can take that. Um, so our financial assistance policy for patients is actually completely comprehensive and in line with the University of Vermont Medical Center. And we do that just to ensure that a patient isn't going to be dinged financially for showing up at our center versus theirs, um, regardless of the ASC fee structure being lower. We still want that same poverty level um, to match the same discount of care for um, for when they do arrive through our doors. Great, thank you. Um, and on the final point, so this is regarding implicit bias for training um, for staff and leadership at the CSC. This stems from the clear data documenting racial disparities in access to care and care delivery for people of color. This is obviously a national and statewide issue. And I just want to uh, make folks aware that there was a recent piece that I recommend that everyone read um, from researchers at the University of Chicago published in Health Affairs documenting how racism and racial bias can be institutionalized through EMR or electronic health record. So their analysis of patient notes from a representative sample of nearly 20,000 patients found that black patients are more than twice as likely as white patients to have at least one negative descriptor added to their history and physical notes. And this is important as there's similar data to suggest that these descriptors lead to lower quality of care for, from providers. People of color are also far more likely to experience discrimination when receiving healthcare services. And Vermont is obviously it's a growing and diversifying state as per the last census count and more immigrants and refugees are coming to the state. So it's a virtual statistical certainty that Vermonters of color would consider seeking care at the CSC, assuming that the CON would be approved. So to best serve these patients, we believe that requiring implicit bias training at a minimum is an important step to help CSC prepare to treat a diverse population of patients with differing needs, means, experience, and characteristics. So we're hopeful that um, the CSC would be willing to commit to this at a minimum, and we're happy to work with the CSC leadership to provide resources about effective trainings and corresponding literature in this area. This is something that we do um, at, at our office and at Vermont Legal Aid. We're a project of Vermont Legal Aid. Um, it's an area of growth for all of us, I think. Um, and if the CSC doesn't commit to this recommendation, we would ask the Green Mountain Care Board to consider issuing it as a condition um, if it decides to approve the application. So we'd love to hear you respond to that. Um, and those are the end of my comments. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. I can um, speak on that as well, just on behalf of Green Mountain Surgery Center, again, as the current operations manager at Green Mountain Surgery Center, we do um, perform implicit bias training with our staff currently. Um, 
And so that is something that we have spoken about as the CSC um, group, that that is something that is absolutely vital to care for our growing population here. Um, and again, we have a comprehensive um, training program that has established a Green Mountain Surgery Center that works very, very well to educate staff on all diversity, training, language barriers, um, pronoun use, um, and all of those different factors that really does impact a patient's level of care, level of comfort, and our ability to serve them properly. Um, so we have full intention of doing that um, at Collaborative Surgery Center. Yes, Liz, thank you. I would also add um, the racial disparities um, were talked about, which we're certainly aware of and doing training on. There also is um, a lot of nuance that goes into caring for um, patients who have um, are gender non-binary and um, identify in different ways there and what sort of um, pronouns you use. There's different points um, from check-in through the procedure um, where it's very important to make all staff aware of um, what a patient's preferred pronouns are, how they want to be addressed. Um, and we had a surgeon who treats these patients. We actually treat a lot of um, these patients um, and particularly um, patients having um, gender um, affirming surgeries, um, which we do a lot of at the Green Mountain Surgery Center, particularly for patients on Medicaid. One of the surgeons who takes care of a lot of that patient population um, actually gave us all of the training materials that we use, um, videos online with um, you know quizzes and role plays that we then distributed upon after her recommendation to our entire staff, tracked compliance with completing it, um, and um, talked about it at our staff meeting so that everyone from the front office to um, the pre-post area to those operating in the surgical suites knows um, what our expectations are and has been through role play to try and um, make sure that their language and their respect for patients is demonstrated um, at every point along the way. So that is something um, that I know the leadership here on this call of CSC, um, Susan and Liz, have already been involved with and certainly would be sure to bring that into um, the new center as well. Great, thank you so much. That's great to hear. Back to you, Mr. Hearing Officer. Okay, thank you. Um, so now we'll move on to questions from the board and we'll start with board member Holmes. Great, thank you so much. Um, thanks for the presentation. I can really appreciate all the hard work that went into submitting the application, addressing all the interrogatories. Uh, I think it's a thoughtful application and I, want to note that I really appreciate the charitable component that you just described about the proposed center. Um, my questions are, are going to focus on quality, I think, for the most part. Um, so you're requesting a CON for an unrestricted multi-specialty outpatient surgery center. Um, I don't know if you have the application in front of you, but uh, on page 70, if that is helpful to you, um, you mentioned in the application that one issue with hospitals is that surgeons must, must cope with delays when nurses who are inexperienced with a particular surgery are staffing the ORs. And that one of the advantages of an ASC is that nurses are trained on a specific set of procedures. So my question, I guess, one of my start of my questions is you only plan to hire six surgical RNs. Um, far less than what hospitals would employ. So I guess my question, my first question to you is, what is a reasonable number of procedures that each RN could realistically be trained in and master so that they're experienced enough to ensure quality in a multi-specialty center? I can take that one. Um, so, the, so the reasoning behind requesting an unrestricted license is to allow for CSC to grow as the outpatient surgery population grows, a CMS um, moves more procedures into the outpatient setting. That's not to say that we're going to welcome 500 surgeons into the in our doors and allow 500 different procedures to be done. Um, we understand that within a four OR capacity, fiscally, 
calendar year wise, everything that that's just not reasonable. So um, our quality measure and need of understanding that you want to have nurses who are specialized to certain specialties and then having an unrestricted license. Um, they are kind of separate issues because it allows us to recruit and meet the need of the community by bringing in surgeons of whatever specialty feels necessary at that point in time. Um, and that allows us, for instance, here at Green Mountain Surgery Center, we have um, multiple specialties going on at this moment, um, and our nurses are able to focus on various areas, meaning we have a core GYN team. And again, we don't have um, we don't have an abundance of OR nurses. We have just the right amount. Um, and it's lean staffing, but they specialize in these procedures. And that is all part of the operational um, kind of background work that goes into the ASC is understanding what our current needs are, understanding the type of staffing we need to recruit and hire. And that is based on um, which type of surgeons would say, I'm going to come on board. I want to start doing procedures there. And then there we would match with the type of nursing that we would need to staff. So do you have any specific policies in place to ensure that the staff that you are hiring has the clinical expertise to support the diverse set of procedures that you do plan to offer? What policies in place do you have? Yeah, that's I mean, that is part of our hiring criteria is, of course, like a extensive background check into their personal history, um, what their clinical history is, what type of cases they've served, which is very standard in any healthcare setting of understanding um, what type of background they have personally from their own training. Liz, I would also add um, that, that in some cases, it's the surgical technicians, not the RNs, the nurses, who are really the experts in terms of the equipment and the support that the surgeon needs during um, a procedure. So an example is retina surgeries. Um, it was actually our surgical technician who really um, the surgeon interviewed and um, determined was excellent at what he did. And he has really trained the circulating nurses and another surgical tech to be real experts in that service. Even at the Green Mountain Surgery Center, you know, we have, as Liz mentioned, not that many um, surgical RNs who work in our ORs, um, less than six. But we also have a team of um, three or four surgical techs. And um, on a certain service, you might only have even half of that team I just met mentioned that always covers that one service because they're the real experts in it. Um, so we do have a lot of, of surgical policies written by our um, OR nurse manager in terms of re what's required to know for each service on the tech level and the RN level. But the way that really gets taught is sometimes through experienced nurses, but also sometimes through experienced surgical technicians who are a real valuable piece of the puzzle. Okay, um, let me probe a little further. Um, CON standard 1.4, um, specifically addresses the volume quality relationship, which I think is related to this conversation. And it requires that applicants have to show that they'll be able to, and this is a direct quote, maintain appropriate volumes for services for which a higher volume of service is positively correlated to better quality. Um, so in the application itself on page 42, uh, you know, there's a, a space for the applicant for you all to address that. And um, I, I just want to, you know, the first sentence in your answer says, we do not believe that our application proposes services for which there is a unique positive correlation between volume and quality. Um, but then the next paragraph says, while there's a demonstrated positive correlation between quality and surgical volume, uh, so I guess what I'm trying to understand here is how can both statements be true um, that there's that your application doesn't propose services for which there's a correlation between volume and quality, but yet there is a demonstrated correlation between volume and quality. So I'm, I'm, I really do want to understand this because it's a standard that has to be met. So I think 
I can help clarify some of that. Um, this is Attorney LaRosa. So I think the intent of the answer, just in that section on page 42 on con standard 1.4, is I think there's a um, there's trying to be a disassociation between any individual procedure, um, which is why the fossa decompression is referenced, versus the overall uh, quality of care provided to the community when there is adequate volume to provide those services. I think you heard Susan in the PowerPoint talk about how long wait times and inadequate access to surgical procedures has negative outcomes, negative health outcomes. And so the intent of this answer, I believe, is to is to express the the point that, you know, there are of course procedures where the more you do, the better. But that that's not really what we're trying to get at with this application. What we're trying to get at, I believe, is the concept that by having and providing adequate capacity to the overall surgical community and surgical field and meeting the community's needs, you're improving health care to the greater community population. And I think if Amy or Liz or Susan want to further comment on that, they should. But I believe if if I'm looking at the, the response on page 42 in the CON application as to CON standard 1.4, that would be the intent to articulate that um, the higher volume and service is positively correlated to better quality. I think what you're talking about is quality of outcomes. That's what we understood it to be. And that by having adequate staffing and adequate provision of surgical services across the broad spectrum of surgical need, you're able to provide better quality care to the community. Okay. Um, I, I understand that interpretation, but I think actually really what's meant here is that the volumes are high enough for which there's a volume quality relationship to support the outcomes. And so I'm just going to dig one more question then and then I'll, I'll let this go. But, um, you know, you're proposing ortho surgeries. Um, and, uh, you know, on slide seven, you actually do mention total and partial knees as surgeries that you might do. That's an area where we, we know there's a relationship between volume and quality. Um, the leapfrog group that you actually cite elsewhere in your application as a source of quality data on ASCs has actually developed minimum volume standards um, of 50 knees per facility and 25 per surgeon and 50 hips per facility and 25 per surgeon. And I think the reason this is kind of my line of questioning is all around this because the reasoning for two of those metrics is that the support staff has to have enough practice to support the surgeon. So maybe I'll just ask it more simply. Will you use um, evidence-based research to develop, for example, minimum surgical volumes like those proposed by the LeapFrog group to ensure that you have that minimum number of surgeries to ensure quality care for your patients? Will you impose have some sort of minimum volume standards where there's um, evidence that it Thank you, um, board member Holmes. That's actually where, after um, Attorney LaRosa finished speaking, I was going to mention as well that when it comes to minimum volume standards, those um, are um, identified by right now, we also have those at the Green Mountain Surgery Center. They are identified by the Medical Advisory Committee, and that's the group of um, the medical director and then surgeons from each of the representative specialties and then our nurse managers. They meet quarterly and determine what, um, you know, all the credentialing goes through them, which surgeons should be credentialed. And part of the credentialing process for certain specialties, one would be ortho, um, which, um, and gastroenterology is another one. They set up minimum standards that anyone who becomes credentialed has to have done at least this many um, surgeries. And if they um, are close to that number, they actually have a process that's developed um, to observe, have observations by more experienced surgeons before they can start doing surgeries on their own if they're anywhere close to the minimum number. So there are actually policies that exist currently at the Green Mountain Surgery Center in response to these um, standards and guided by them. And I think at CSC, the intent would be to develop um, a similar process there. Okay, great. Um, and then let me, my last question actually involves something that you just mentioned. Um, and I'm interested in the governance structure and particularly how it relates to quality assurance. Um, in nonprofit hospitals, right, trustees who comprise patients and members of the local community typically have seats on the board and they typically have seats on the quality committee. 
So your governance structure was a bit unclear to me. Um, in the governing policy you submitted in response to the first set of questions, it says TBD for governing board membership. So, and then in, in exhibit six, I think you outlined that the quality committee will be comprised of a center administrator, nurse managers, and members of the center staff. So then every member of the quality committee as it's currently comprised has a financial stake in the center and it doesn't seem to be any community or patient representation in the way your governance structure operates, which is different than how hospitals operate. So my, I guess my question is really twofold. Who's going to sit on the board of managers? Will it include any community members, patients, and what role, if any, will patients and community members play in quality oversight? So uh, the, the governing um, board has um, yet to be uh, constructed. Um, Susan and Liz um, would be leaders on it. And then the surgeons who operate at the center would also be members as I think we described. The uh, medical advisory committee then will be the medical director. And then as I mentioned, members, um, surgeons who operate across the different specialties at the center, and then um, the nurse managers, um, the head of the pre post department and um, the OR department, um, and, um, and then someone from the front office staff as well. Then the Quality Assurance and Performance Improvement Committee, which is the one that you just described, which has um, really the working members of the staff. So that has, um, technicians on it that has um, medical assistants that has nurses on it. Um, it's really an inter interdisciplinary group, including um, the administrator or director of the center. Um, what that group does is um, looks at the feedback from, from patient surveys. And Liz, you can talk about um, how the patient survey feedback um, how um, constant it is, how consistent it is, um, how widespread it is, how it gets incorporated into staff meetings, into quality assurance and performance um, improvement committee meetings, um, all of that, Liz, I know you're very familiar with that and running that process, so maybe some more on that would be helpful. Yeah, and part of, um, as Amy said, with the quality assurance and performance improvement and then also the environment of care committee, um, as mentioned on our organizational chart that was submitted with our um, application, that all goes up into our medical advisory committee. It's also reviewed by the medical director and the administrator. Um, but one of our key initiatives will be to ensure that patients feel heard. One of my current roles here, um, again, as operations manager, is I'm consistently looking at patient feedback, receiving and um, calling back patients um, positive and negative and you know we work through it all um, even if it's from a billing perspective or care perspective um, we have we plan to have very robust processes in place of follow-up procedures for those patients um, I, I reassure patients currently at Green Mountain Surgery Center that their um, concerns or compliments will be addressed in our upcoming meetings and um, all of these things take place weekly daily um, I send out a message to all the nurse managers to ensure that they're aware of this and they always bring any of these to both the medical advisory committee and medical director and administrator. So the community is heard by way of feedback and our um, patient feedback survey currently at Green Mountain Surgery Center goes out um, postoperatively via a link um, and our use, our utilization rate is quite high for that um, and we do review that consistently. Uh, monthly in our staff meetings. I plan at Collaborative Surgery Center to um, go through all of those and any sort of um, issue that arises will be spoken about in a way that can be constructive. Um, and again, there's always follow up. So while our structure does not have any community members outside of the facility directly on any of these committees, their voice is heard, um, and that is by a very robust system that um, communicates cons constantly with our patients. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you. So next we'll move to board member Lunge. 
Um, <laughs> you sound like a chipmunk on helium. Not working. <laughs> Great. Yes. We'll just give Robin a log on and sign back in. Is that better? Yes. Yes. Very yeah. Nice. Did you already move to somebody else or shall I begin? Uh, no, we didn't. OK, well, good morning, everyone. I'm glad I could lend a little levity with my technical difficulties. Um, so I had a quick follow up for from um, board member Holmes's questions related to minimum volume standards. Ms. Cooper, you talked about the credentialing process that was helpful. My follow up was obviously you'll do that before uh, someone comes on board. How frequently do you assess the minimum volume standards after uh, the person is credentialed? Um, currently, it's every two years. Thank they you. They get credentialed. OK, great. Very helpful. Um, so my first question is related to the utilization assumptions that you included in response to the first set of questions, which is on pages one to two of your response to that inquiry. Um, in response to our staff question related, at least I thought that's where it was, um, but now I'm looking and it appears to be later. Hold on just one second. Let me see if I can find it. It was in response. Here we go. It's in response to question set three. Um, and it's the assumptions for four operating rooms versus three operating rooms with a low, medium and high. In your application, uh, it looks like the four operating rooms, low assumptions are consistent with the application and you explained your assumptions. I'm wondering if you could just briefly indicate to us how you arrived at the medium and high assumptions so we can understand what went into those estimates. And that was in question set three, I'm just, just for clarification. Yes, question set three, and it's, uh, there's not a page number on it, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but it's after the patient estimate example. It's the charts with the assumptions for four and three operating rooms. I think it may be in response to question seven. That's maybe where we reference chart the charts, the assumptions for three and four. Yes, but and you did I not actually indicate what the assumptions were. The so if you could just talk through it. Sorry, Amy. No, that's okay. Yeah. The difference in the high, medium, and low um, assumptions, the variable that changes in each scenario is the procedure time, the time that it takes to do the procedure. Um, and um, this are the low assumption is just using what, um, you know, real data that we have available, which I think is mentioned, which is the, the procedure time, including turnaround time in the ORs. So not in the procedure rooms, but only in the ORs at Green Mountain Surgery Center. And I think yep. that was 105 minutes total. Um, yes. We do um, a lot of, um, you know, relatively quick procedures in the OR um, right now, hand surgery procedures, um, retina, as I mentioned, um, um, plastic surgery procedures, um, which can be long or short, but a lot of ours currently are shorter um, time. Relative to um, procedures that might be done at CSC in the future, so, and um, Liz has a lot of experience with this, having worked in um, orthopedics ORs in particular, but those cases themselves might take um, two hours or 120 minutes, and then you have a lot of cleanup because of all the equipment. So then you're looking at 150 minute um, procedure time plus turnover at least. Um, and then again, depending on um, 
urology procedures was also have a lot of equipment involved in them and imaging as well within the procedure. So those case times again are going to be longer. And I believe that in the medium scenario, um, I, I don't have the table in front of me. Maybe we used 120 or 150. Um, but 120. 120. Yep. Okay. And then I think if you look at the other data that was submitted by the um, local hospitals on their procedure length, that the high scenario is maybe um, close to those hospitals in procedure length time, but below them even, um, considering that um, the turnover time um, likely will be more efficient and faster. But I think the range ranges from the low end what we do at Green Mountain Surgery Center, which are probably gonna be shorter procedures than what is planned at CSC um, to sort of the long end, the high end, if we did um, you know, have surgeons who are doing more of the total joints in the future that take and other surgeries that take a lot longer. Liz, is that, um, do you have something to add there? Is that a good description? No, I think that's a that's a very accurate description um, based on it's really based on the specialties that come on board again with with the proposed unrestricted license um, depends on which surgeons come on and of those surgeons. What what is their concentration of case type? And, and I have. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Amy. No, I was going to say a point that you raised um, about just the variation even within a specialty. Um, yes. The sports medicine procedures in orthopedics are totally different length, totally different payer mix, totally different patient population than joint replacement procedures. Also orthopedics, but fully, you know, much older po patient population, much different payer mix, much, much different equipment and time. Um, you know, Liz is really an orthopedics expert if there's more questions about that area particularly, but the um, projections and the predictions about this are, are difficult when even within one specialty, the range um, in terms of procedure times, payer mix, et cetera, patient age population targeting um, can range, can vary so widely. Absolutely, and I think um, just, sorry, and not, That's okay. not to keep dragging that on, but um, another area within orthopedics that obviously will have a huge impact on time is the patient condition. Um, you know, I've been in knee replacement surgeries where it's a, it's a younger athlete with um, slight degenerative disease, um, and then I've been in a knee replacement of the same age patient with severe disease, um, and it can go from an hour and 20 minute procedure to I've been in a five hour total knee replacement procedure. Um, and um, again, as Amy said, within the orthopedics realm, um, spine um, does fall into that, the orthopedic spine type cases. And those are, of course, um, while it sounds quite intense, as I'm sure all of you know, there are some very quick spine procedures and there are some very lengthy spine procedures. So again, it's that fluctuation of you know, until you know the exact surgeon and their specialty that would be coming on board. Um, um, it, it is hard to estimate a really kind of like key in on what their case times would be. Great, thank you. Thank you, that was helpful. Um, I also wanted to draw your attention to a public comment that we had received about your characterization of PCI um, surgeries as preventative. Um, and I was wondering if you would like to respond to that. Sure, I can respond to that. Um, first, I'll just say we're super impressed that an interventional cardiologist had the time um, to read through our application and re um, comment on it. And I'll just say our inclusion of um, even mentioning PCI in our application um, was really stemmed from a desire to try and um, plan for the future because cardiology is one of those areas or specialties where um, they very recently started approving um, some procedures to be done in an ASC setting and it seems to be growing. So we really just wanted to include it to show, you know, that things are dynamic and change and things are added all the time. Not being cardiologists, we did um, obviously make the incorrect assumption that getting PCI in either a hospital or ASC setting, um, that the patient would experience the same sort of improvement in their health with respect to you know, future heart attack and mortality risk. We didn't understand that 
um, a patient who would qualify for their proceed PCI procedure in um, an ASC setting has different, um, you know, outcomes than that same patient than a patient who um, would qualify for it in the um, hospital setting. So we stand corrected, and we're actually happy to get that feedback, and uh, would love to have someone like Dr. Gogo uh, consult on uh, with us um, should we ever include cardiology procedures at the center. Thank you. Next, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about your service area. Um, it's and confirm what I believe is the service area you are uh, asserting, which is that your primary service area would be Chittenden, Franklin, and Grand Isle, with a secondary service area of Lamoille, Washington, and Addison, and some upstate New York. Uh, counties, which I won't list, um, and then the tertiary service area would be the rest of Vermont. Is that accurate or uh, did I mess that up? That's accurate. It is. Okay. And we also anticipate some patients coming from Canada. Okay, thank you. Okay, and in your application, you discussed um, the potential impacts as you've assessed them to UVMMC. What would be the impacts to the hospitals in the secondary service area and in Franklin and Grand Isle, which you've listed as a primary service area, if you know? Well, I'll just start. And, um, you know, I think the literature shows that um, the biggest impact is for those that are closest um, proximity to the uh, ambulatory surgery center. So we, and the impact there is projected to be quite small, I believe is two, two to 4%. Um, so we do not anticipate that the impact to um, hospitals further away would be significant. Okay. And I would there, like to, to add, um, I would like to add to that just um, Again, uh, and on behalf of Green Mountain Surgery Center, just living through this ruthless pandemic that won't seem to give up these days, um, we have um, been able to actually collaborate with surgeons from area hospitals, such as Northwest Medical Center, um, when their staffing needs got to um, dire levels that they were having to um, reschedule their patients. Um, that those surgeons were able to call us. They were already credentialed here, mind you, but they were able to call us and ask for increased capacity um, for operating time here to not have to push those patients that were already waiting or possibly rescheduled multiple times. And of course, we accommodated that. We made things work. We pushed things around. Um, we split rooms in the OR, whatever we had to do to get these patients seen. So I think that um, redundancy in the healthcare system has been seen in real time, and we hope that that can continue happening at Collaborative Surgery Center. Thank you, Liz. Sure. I was also going to add on the that's one way that um, the existence of the Green Mountain Surgery Center has already supported surgeons who primarily operate at Northwest Medical Center when the OR time there got crunched due to COVID and staffing and other concerns. Um, they asked if we had extra time, we had it available, and we were able to maintain um, continuity of service and access to elective surgeries that would have otherwise been canceled at the small hospital. Um, there are at least two surgeons that uh, have moved to Vermont to operate at Green Mountain Surgery Center, who, um, when they have patients who are higher acuity, um, older, needing um, or just live up in the Franklin County um, area, um, those surgeons um, are preferred to operate at a small hospital where they know the staff and it's more um, um, familiar and um, they know their equipment. Sometimes they bring their own equipment. But instead of opting, opting to um, maintain privileges at the big medical center in Chittenden County, they actually go and seek privileges at Northwest Medical Center and now have brought new surgeries that, that wouldn't have been here um, had these surgeons not moved back to Northwest Medical Center. Um, and that's happened in at least two different specialties already. So um, just um, things that have happened in terms of our relation to the other smaller hospitals that no one necessarily anticipated um, before the project was approved, um, but now have actually managed to have that sort of collaboration in real life. 
Thank you. And um, if you are approved as an unrestricted uh, multi specialty surgery center, what would the impacts be to the Green Mountain Surgery Center? Currently, the Green Mountain Surgery Center, so part of our application, um, if I can step back a little bit, part of our application is that we would not have overlapping shareholders, meaning that the current physician owners at Green Mountain Surgery Center, um, by way of, of sharing the pool, if you will, would not be able to be in investor functions over at Collaborative Surgery Center. Um, the Green Mountain Surgery Center is operating at um, right at our sweet spot. Um, Quite frankly, we are we are unable to continue accommodating new surgeons at this point um, because our calendar is quite full, and we always like to um, keep open that 10 to 15 percent a minimum capacity in order to accommodate those urgent um, cases. Um, so that being said, we are um, the, there's a couple services, of course, with an unrestricted license that would be overlapped but it would not pull from any one practice um, and to compete. One of the services that we hope that we currently provide here at Green Mountain Surgery Center is pediatric dentistry, which is primarily a Medicaid group, um, Medicaid population, I'm sorry. And that is something that we really hope to provide at Collaborative Surgery Center solely because using or working with these dentists at um, Timberlane pediatric dentistry, as well as other dentists um, around the service area that have reached out to us personally. Um, there's such a significant wait time issue with these children, um, upwards of 10 to 12 months, um, resulting in the children going into the emergency room. So there will be some overlapping of services um, and that's planned for and that's noted. And again, the physician owners at Green Mountain Surgery Center are completely aware of this. And um, there is no um, hesitation or hard feeling that there will be any sort of pull from either way. Okay. And how about the eye surgery center? Impacts to the eye surgery center if it's unrestricted. Well, currently the cataract cases that were um, previously done, I believe at Fannie Allen um, aren't, aren't currently occurring. Um, and so, of course, there is the possibility of that of those services being able to be performed at Collaborative Surgery Center. Um, we've worked well with um, the retina center, or I'm sorry, um, the um, cataract services to date, knowing that Green Mountain Surgery Center cannot perform those cases independently. Um, but we don't foresee that being a large spectrum of care. As we've mentioned, our four core does not include the cataracts. Um, so that is not something that we would be focusing on. But as we've said throughout the application, if there is a community need, if there is a significant backlog, if there is a cataract surgeon who is seeking to be able to provide these services, then we would of course accommodate and at least speak to them about how we could accommodate these procedures for them. Okay, thank you. Um, in two places in your application, you reference that most large commercial payers uh, base their contractual reimbursement on a percentage of Medicare. Are you aware that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont does not reimburse as a percentage of Medicare? Yes. And they are uh, Vermont's largest health insurer? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, could you explain your assumptions for bad debt and charity care in the financial table six as it was revised. And please take your time and pull it up if you'd like. Thank you. Liz, I know you're looking for it um, yeah. on a high level. I believe those were based on um, the experience at the Green Mountain Surgery Center with bad debt and charity care, which is our obviously 
um, only comp and closest comp. Yeah, so yeah. it's okay. one and a half percent generally. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, so that was. Um, I'm sorry, this is the court reporter. I didn't get the percent that someone said. One and a half percent. One and a half percent. Thank you. And um, as Amy mentioned, that is based on true numbers and really our only kind of data point for real time numbers. Um, that's below market standard in healthcare, um, but that is an analysis that we did in real time for Green Mountain Surgery Center over the course of operating months. Um, that's a number that um, Amy and I have worked on together um, to estimate the true number um, to ensure that our revenue is accounted for appropriately. Um, and the 1.5% is accurate. Great. Okay. And thank that, you. you know, in Vermont, in Vermont, we're very, um, there's been a lot of work on ensuring that a high level of the population has health insurance, whether it's yes. Medicaid or it's commercial insurance. So compared to national comparisons, you know, the bad debt and the charity care is lower um, in some cases. I mean, um, but part of the reason for that is just how much access there is to health to health insurance. Sure. Um, I had a question uh, related to that from um, Elizabeth's testimony earlier. Uh, when I looked at the charity care policy that you provided to us um, in your submission, uh, it was not clear to me that it would cover something such as uh, an unpaid deductible, uh, but it sounded like Elizabeth that that was the intent. Is that correct? Sorry, I'm pulling it up just so I can see the exact wording on that. Sure. Yeah, and I'll get it up too. So on page two of the charity care policy under eligible services. Um, towards the end of the paragraph, it says services reimbursed directly to the patient by the insurance carrier or covered by another third party are not eligible for financial assistance. Um, and it's the covered by it's the covered by language that is confusing to me because certainly like a deductible would be related to a service where most of the cost potentially was covered by the insurance carrier, but the deductible itself would be the patient share that was obviously not covered. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think your charity care if policy could use a little bit of revision if the intent is to cover the patient cost sharing and you could be a little more explicit about that. So I wanted to understand what the intent was versus what I had read in the document. From, I'm having trouble finding that exact document right now, I'm, I apologize, um, but okay. one, um, our financial assistance policy does outline that regardless of the ability to pay, um, we would work with the patient. Um, and so I, I'm not sure if that answers your question entirely. I agree that that wording might not be entirely clear and that is something that we can work on to ensure. Um, and again, it's our goal is to be um, in line with area hospitals um, and to ensure that they have the same opportunity for um, access to care. Um, regardless of ability to pay. Okay, and the charity care uh, and bad debt policy, I presumably uh, applies to the facility fee only since that's what you would charge. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, um, and do you know or would you know what type of uh, charity or or bad debt policy the physicians, the physician owners would employ? I mean, obviously not specifically, but in general, how does that work? There is um, at, at least how it works at the Green Mountain Surgery Center is when we have a patient who applies to financial assistance and qualifies. We also pass that patient to the physician office, and oftentimes it's the physician themselves who reach out to the patient and um, come up with a um, agreed upon um, amount that the patient is able to pay after us having given the physician the information that we have. Thank you. And then lastly, um, related to charity care, if um, 
if I assume that at some point you potentially will refer cases to a debt collection, um, and I wonder if you could speak to how you would anticipate that working. Um, I can speak to that, and we um, we actually currently um, just speaking in practice for on behalf of Green Mountain Surgery Center. We do not use a debt collection agency. Um, part of our ethics and standards are that we do not believe a patient should go into any financial stress um, based on an inability to pay for health care. So we do not incur any um, any sort of collections agency that can ding a credit or um, God forbid hurt someone's housing situation or anything like that. So that is not something that we would ever intend to do. We just we don't think that that's ethical. Great, thank you. I am coming to a close. Um, I had a couple of other questions. So you've provided us with information on uh, slide seven related to Medicare prices, which I, uh, is it a correct assumption that you pulled those from Medicare's price compare tool on the web, their website? Correct. Okay. Um, and then I'm wondering if you could speak to Medicare's policy of site neutrality and how that might impact on uh, differentials between ASCs and hospital outpatient departments. And if you're not prepared to answer the question, you can, you know, certainly let me know that. A good question. Um, I'll admit that I haven't uh, updated my knowledge on where CMS is at with the site neutrality policy. Okay, thank you. Um, and then in terms of Medicaid's reimbursement for ambulatory surgical centers, how does that compare to hospital outpatient departments? Vermont Medicaid specifically. So and again, Totally fine to say if you're not, if you can't answer the question. Sorry, Amy, didn't mean to interrupt you. No, that's okay. I was just gonna ask, Liz and I have both been um, very involved with Vermont Medicaid over the last two years on helping them to develop and their consultants to develop a fee schedule for um, for ambulatory surgery centers um, when the green, and so Liz, I'll just start and then you can chime in on things I'm forgetting. Um, um, the, when Green Mountain Surgery Center opened, um, the Vermont Medicaid was paying Green Mountain Surgery Center off the physician fee schedule. Um, so Vermont Medicaid up to that point had a physician fee schedule and a hospital fee schedule, and that's all. Um, yep. And and um, historically, I think that may not have been a problem. I don't know the details, but for the surgery center that existed because their um, patient base is primary in Medicare and Medicare has a fee schedule. So we started seeing um, Medicaid patients from the time we opened a Green Mountain Surgery Center and realized is that the facility fee that we were getting paid um, was not near covering the cost of the drugs and the room time and the nurses and everything else. And we said, where is this coming from? You know, it was a tenth um, in some cases of what the hospital payment from Vermont Medicaid was. Um, and then we realized, oh, I think they're paying us off the physician fee schedule, got in touch with folks at Medicaid, say, do you realize this is happening? It may be time to relook at this. Um, and they said, oh, that's a good point. We do, we ought to relook at this and develop an actual um, ambulatory surgery center fee schedule instead of, um, you know, just using the physician fee schedule to pay surgery centers, particularly, you know, planning for the future um, if this becomes, um, you know, future ones. So we went through a lot of um, back and forth and, um, advice studies, how other states are doing it. They brought um, their fee consultant in we had um, um, conference calls with them. We brought the dentists in because uh, uh, you know we were about to bring on the Medicaid dental service. Um, so they gave us um, their views on how things work. Medicaid listened to that, went away and um, did some research on all of it. 
came back and created an ASC fee schedule, which was just implemented in July of 2021. And Medicaid is now paying, um, from my understanding, you'd have to confirm this with them, that they pay surgery centers the same rates that they pay um, hospitals and surgery centers in other states outside of Vermont, which is lower than the Medicaid rate paid to in-state Vermont hospitals and paid to in-state Vermont medical centers, um, but is similar to how they would pay if Vermont Medicaid patients went to out-of-state surgery centers or hospitals. That's my current understanding um, of how that works. And I'll, right. and I'll typically, oh, I'm sorry, Elizabeth. Typically their fee schedules are posted publicly. So that is something we can take a look at to confirm. And I was sorry to add that within the Vermont um, Medicaid ASC fee schedule, um, a lot of the surgeries, as we've mentioned, um, are gender affirmation surgeries of um, breast reductions, of um, self injectomies, of things of that nature, um, GYN procedures. Um, there's a whole plethora of them. Um, but there is what they call a grouper um, for ASCs, which allows reimbursement only on the primary code. So that is kind of more of that bundle payment service that um, that we've agreed to and that we are performing currently. Thank you for explaining that. That was helpful. Yep. OK, I have just one more question. Um, could I, you explained in uh, the application your current roles in relationship to the center. Could you please explain your what you would anticipate your roles would be with the new center? once it's if it is approved and opened. Sure, I can start um, as as is very evident. Um, I am operations manager at Green Mountain Surgery Center currently um, and I run our business office here as well. Um, and we have been in, um, you know, we've of course spoken about future roles um, at Collaborative Surgery Center, um, knowing that it definitely will take a full time human to do the same role in another setting. Um, that's not probably realistic to think, especially as Susan mentioned, I'm 30 weeks pregnant. Um, so we are, um, that's all in the talks. And that's something that Amy and I are consistently kind of looking at and analyzing of uh, what the future will bring should a CON be issued. Um, but just reassurance that we are aware of any sort of overlap of interest and that we are taking that into strong consideration when we are thinking about future plans. And I think Susan, just to mention, you know, your um, experience and knowledge and expertise really comes from being involved in Vermont's healthcare system more broadly and all the reform um, and efforts that have been going into improving it. Um, and so I think, you know, the idea top level is that is that Liz would be in charge of operations and Susan would be in charge of um, the foundation and the community partnerships. Um, and then I'm a consultant um, offering my guidelines and advice on how to develop it. Thank you. Um, I'll turn it back to you. Hearing Officer Barber. Thank you. So this might be a good time for a five minute break if anybody needs a break. Sure. So why don't we uh, come back at uh, 10 15? Uh, thank you all for your. Uh, it, it's amazing to me that this is like a $5.3 million investment and the level of detail um, that that you folks have uh, um, come to understand is, is is impressive. And so I thank you for all that work. Um, my first question um, has to do with the real estate transactions. And um, so the the application profile, the letter of intent to lease between CSC and the Colchester Real Estate Company um, holding an option to purchase a 525 Hercules Drive. Um, and But it seems uh, there are filings at the Secretary of State's office that dissolve um, LR and W effective 1231-21 and the Colchester Real Estate Company effective 113-22. And so I'm just wondering if uh, you can clarify whether this is so 
um, and tell us the current status of the entities involved with the real estate supporting uh, CSC's application. So um, I'll, I'll comment on that. I don't think any of the witnesses specifically know about that transaction. I believe um, that the Colchester Real Estate Company has closed pursuant to its option and has uh, acquired the subject property. So, um, but if if the filings at the Secretary of State's office have the Colchester Real Estate Company um, dissolving, what what has taken its place? Uh, that may be an error. I don't know. I don't really represent them. There's, I'm not entirely sure what if there's a new entity that they've assigned their rights to. Um, uh, we can certainly confirm that we don't. We're not them. Okay, so I mean, so uh, I mean that is important. I'm just wondering whether or not you know there's uh, uh, changes to the to, to the financial arrangements here. Whether there's a new landlord, whether there is um, a new letter of intent, and obviously the option to purchase uh, probably is uh, is null now if if the purchase has been made, but. Uh, I'm just wondering if if um, we can get some update on this situation to make sure that um, because a lot of this rolls out into the next 10 years and uh, you know whether or not um, the profile of the deal that's presented to us is still the deal that um, uh, exists, if, if that's all right with you folks. Sure, we understand that, they, that, that if there is any change in the technical nature of the landlord's name and entity, it uh, would be a full assignment of the letter of intent to lease. Our understanding is that any future owner would be subject to the lease and the terms of the letter of intent to lease. And that if there is a special purpose entity with additional real real estate investors, we don't know about, uh, who would take it over. Um, well, I also don't have reference to the dissolved. I'm looking at the Vermont Secretary of State and that may be a filing error based on the timing. So we'll certainly check. Confirm with the board, not an issue. Well, we can send you a copy of the filing if you'd like. Oh, I have it. I see it. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah. assuming that uh, um, that situation basically stays the same, um, the uh, um, and, and it, it, you know there is a change. I mean, the landlord. Uh, was to deliver the fit up premises as per the plans prepared by Wyman, Lanfear, and Architects. Initial fit up costs uh, were estimated or are estimated at 2.4 million. Landlord will incur initial fit up costs and said costs will be reimbursed by tenant through the payment of the base rent of $64 per square foot. So my question, given the prior arrangement, was if the fit up as per the plans prepared by Wyman, Lanfear, architects cost more than 2.4 million is that the landlord's obligation to cover these costs with the rent remaining at $64 per square foot. And I, so I, I, I think that question shows why it's important for us to understand what the real estate deal is here, because uh, the landlord might be different. I mean, um, um, the landlord might be now Colchester real estate company, um, and so until we can see kind of what this deal is, it's kind of hard to assess you know, the underlying relationships. Sorry, can you ask that question again? I'm not sure. I'm not sure okay. I understood it. So, it, so um, in the, the original arrangement or the uh, landlord was to uh, um, do $2.4 million of fit up specifically um, um, in, aligned with Wyman Lanford Architects of uh, $2.4 million cost. And so my question was, if if the um, that fit up um, as, as uh, designed by Wyman Landfair Architects is cost more than $2.4 million, who's who's on the hook for that? Uh, it, you know, would it be the, um, the tenant or would it be the landlord? And I'm not quite sure who the landlord is now, um, but, um, you know, who, who's bearing the risk of a fit up 
going beyond two point like four million. Over, like, like a cost overrun. Yeah, because because there's a provision later in in the uh, in the document that says that um, that if the deal closes, uh, basically, I, I can read it to you. It says immediately following the receipt of a certificate of need, tenant will have ten business days to determine additional work tenant requires above and beyond the landlord contribution. All additional work will be, and that's additional to um, the uh, Wyman's work. All additional work will be considered tenant fit up, and as such, the tenant will be responsible for the cost. So I I'm just wondering, the, you follow me? Yeah, yeah. So the so the intent of that in the negotiation early on uh, to come up with this letter of intent to lease was that if the two point four million dollar number was, there, I mean, obviously there's a contingency built into that initial estimate, um, as any large construction project has. The, uh, the intent and understanding of that would be if the fit up was, you know, reasonably greater, um, then that would be rolled into the overall cost of the lease. But it's really not expected to be much overrun given the sort of high value estimate that was placed on it and sort of the retainage that was included in the $2.4 million number. Um, it's our understanding that if there was exceedance, that would be included in the cost of the, the rent, which is sort of how this is all paid back. So would that be that the rent would go up beyond $64 a square foot or that the um, the rent in the future um, to the landlord would would effectively be diminished because because uh, you know, part of the, the cash flow went for these added tenant fit ups? I guess I'd like to see this. This I don't know. I don't know how, quite how to ask ask the question now because I don't know what the arrangement is. But I my concern was, or my question was, it's a sixty four sixty four dollar per square foot rent. Part of that was to pay for the two point four million dollar fit up, and the rest of that then fell to the landlord. And so, if you're telling me that um, that uh, if it's significantly above the $2.4 million, it will be the tenant that will pick that up. And I think that then does, you know, uh, have some impact on the um, <clears throat> collaborative surgery centers finances. I don't know, but it's uh, it's just a kind of uh, a change that we just, I, I, I think we just need to make sure we understand it. The um, Well, that's sort of, I mean, those are two, Two different questions, right? So, um, the first question is: Does the if there is a new business holder, if there's a new real estate entity, are they subscribing to the terms and conditions of the lease? Intend to lease. Second, if there's a cost overrun, how is that allocated? Right. Those are the sort of two issues you're pointing out. Right. Our understanding of the cost overrun, we're happy to confirm it for you, is that it would be yeah, amortized and spread out accordingly, um, which is the intent of this provision. So you so so what you're saying is that it would be uh, uh, spread out over that ten years and the because uh, it was a fixed amount um, um, every year for the tenant to pay back that uh, uh, that fit up investment. So what you're saying is that the amount coming out of this um, collaborative surgery center's budget would be more um, than is what profiled now because the the cost would be more. I mean, I think it's sort of axiomatic that if costs that if the cost of construction somehow for any project exceeded the initial estimate, that that would affect the overall bottom line of the project. I mean, I certainly can't say that any construction project is guaranteed to hit its bottom line number, certainly not today and certainly not ever in the future or in the past. Um, this number, though, is based on you know, uh, pretty conservative estimates based on current material costs, which, as we know, are very high. And I think there's a fair to high degree of confidence in speaking with Wyman Lamphere and um, uh, the people who built the Green Mountain Surgery Center that this is a pretty reasonable number construction wise um, for this project. Oh, okay, so if there's any update for us, you know, that you can submit to us so that we can see this, 
um, on the financials, for example, that, that were submitted with the uh, the application. If, if, uh, if we can see it, it would be helpful just to understand it. Um, okay. My next my next question um, kind of was a rollout of that 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 the way that the uh, the cash flows worked um, <clears throat> out of the sixty four dollars per square foot rent, netting the two point four million dollars out of that on an annual basis, that left um, uh, about a thirty seven dollar per square foot uh, for the landlord, and I'm just wondering if if any research was done to, to figure out whether or not that first year uh, base uh, uh, amount going to the landlord at $37 a square foot, you know, was within the marketplace. Just, you know, is that a number that 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 is comparable to what's going on in the control Colchester real estate market for the this Colchester real estate market is charging even higher premiums for, for space right now. Okay. Um, my next question was had to do on the income statement um, where the annual growth of the net patient revenue for years two, three, and four were 7.7%, 10.4%, and 10.1% respectively. Um, relative to the expenses um, against, against that revenue for clinical personal, clinical personal costs, clinical expenses, non-personnel, and administrative expenses, those grew exactly at the same rate, you know, as the net, net present revenue on an annualized basis. Um, and, you know, I, such fiscal symmetry is unlikely to, to occur. And um, so I'm wondering, uh, since uh, last July, when you made this application, whether or not um, there's any kind of further insight into the growth rate, expected growth rates for clinical personal costs, clinical expenses, non-personnel, and administrative expenses. Amy or Susan, I didn't do the baseline projections. Sorry, I was on mute. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. So um, the Revenue per case is um, one key driver of that is the case mix and how that changes. Um, so through the projections, you know, we had projected cases by specialty. And what we've seen is if you move your mix from, you know, lower lower revenue per case services to higher revenue per case services, you know, uh, for example, from GI cases, um, gastroenterology cases to more um, plastic surgery or OR cases, your revenue per case increases. So that's some of the case mix shift there in the four years out um, is driving that revenue increase, whereas the um, clinical costs are, um, are staying um, consistently growing, they're growing, but they're staying consistent. I mean, one thing that we have found at the Green Mountain Surgery Center that informed these projections is how much space there is to control costs. Um, one of the rules we have, and Liz can talk to this as well, but anytime we purchase new instruments or equipment at the Green Mountain Surgery Center, or even disposables, um, is we have to get um, three different um, quotes on it and um, negotiate before we decide what to purchase. Um, this is really a lot of what Liz Liz's job is. Um, and the um, ways that you can control costs um, by really being focused on it and making it an active part of your sourcing and procurement in a surgery center um, I've really been astounded by how much um, how much ability there is to do that and to instead of paying forty thousand dollars for a piece of um, instrumentation that um, doctors have requested, you can get quotes and find someone who's selling it who only used it for a year, get it inspected, and then save thirty thousand dollars. I mean, it is um, and those kinds of savings if you're looking for them are available regularly that's how we've managed to keep clinical costs um, below 
um, what the budget is at the current Green Mountain Surgery Center, and that sort of um, work has also informed the projections for the Collaborative Surgery Center. Well, thank you for that. I, I just, uh, um, I mean, I fully understood that the expense profile is a, uh, you know, work in progress and, and is, a, is an estimate. It just seemed uh, so spectacularly aligned that revenues were perfectly aligned with these expenses um, in terms of their growth rate. And, uh, and you know, a lot of things have changed since last July, and I'm wondering whether or not you're more worried or less worried about, um, you know, the, the, the financial future, given that. Um, so I, my last question kind of has to do with not, not the case mix in terms of procedures, but just the, the uh, payer mix. And, um, <clears throat> you know, your application says that the uh, uh, Collaborative Surgery Center will accept all forms of insurance, including Medicaid, and the Collaborative Surgery Center will require all physicians performing surgeries procedures to sign a document agreeing to serve Medicaid patients if the board determines it necessary to condi uh, for, as a condition in, in the CON. Um, there is a difference between agreeing to serve Medicaid patients and actually serving Medicaid patients. Um, and so say we agree that the uh, Collaborative Surgery Center's estimate of a payer mix of 12% Medicaid is appropriate and reasonable. Reasonable, if the uh, collaborative surgery center doesn't experience an actual Medicaid payer mix in that vicinity, might what might be some remedial conditions the board uh, could impose? For example, would it be reasonable to restrict distributions to members until a payer mix in the vicinity of 12% is achieved? I think um, just to comment on the Medicaid population that we plan to serve um, at Collaborative Surgery Center, as mentioned, um, pediatric dentistry is one of the core four um, specialties that we are requesting be able to serve um, in that there is a significant wait time issue as we've spoken about as well. And given um, clinical history here at Green Mountain Surgery Center, we could serve pediatric dentistry patients if we had the capacity five days a week. Um, and that would that's not going away anytime soon. Um, and we also so that being said, the 12% Medicaid will be, um, I believe, really a large portion of that will come from the um, pediatric dentistry population. The remainder of the population that we'll be serving again is um, Within the Medicaid population that we see here, um, we do a lot of, again, the gender affirmation surgeries. We do not um, restrict or limit based on the patient's payer. Um, quite frankly, in the business office, we, other than verifying that their benefits are live, we do not look at their benefits for any other reason other than to make sure that we have a, a plan on file to bill or that we have a self-paid policy to put in place to let the patient know what they owe. Um, uh, so just commenting on the actual volume, um, I do not foresee a 12% Medicaid population being an issue whatsoever for our um, future collaborative surgery center to serve, given the specialties that we are hoping to bring in here. Okay. Uh, that said, what 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 if what if it is a problem though? What what if we're down in the two to three percent range in terms of uh, serving Medicaid patients? Um, Do you have any suggestions as to a remedial action that uh, the Collaborative Surgery Center could take to fix that problem? I mean, I view it as a problem. I think, you know, serving Medicaid people is very important. And uh, so um, if, if, if uh, circumstances drift such that that number is down in the single digits, low single digits, what should we do about it? You can ponder that and <laughs> send us your thoughts. Um, that, that That's the one I came up with just because you were tying this to physicians' agreements. And uh, um, and so restricting distributions to those same folks might be an encouragement to, um, uh, uh, to uh, spend more time with some Medicaid patients. 
Um, and I think that was it for me. Um, I would like to, if there are any updated real estate documents, um, um, I would like to see those because that's uh, it's fundamental to how, how the ship leaves the dock um, and who's paying for what. And um, I think that we need to have a clear picture of that. And if, and, and in my mind right now, even the ownership isn't clear. I don't know, given those, um, um, <clears throat> you know, those filings at the Secretary of State's office, there's a, it, it's an unknown to me at this point in time. So thank you very much, and thank you for um, all your effort here. Thank you. Okay, now we'll move to Board Member Walsh. Questions? You're on mute, Tom. I'd like to join my other board members with uh, thanking you for the work uh, to prepare uh, for this CON. Um, there's a lot that goes into it, and I want to recognize that and um, thank you for it. Um, could you confirm uh, for us that there are no, there'll be no diagnostic equipment, no CT, MRI uh, scans uh, in the facility? And if not, where will patients receive those services? So um, there will not be any CAT scan or MRI um, services within the facility. There will be other um, imaging um, tools such as large size C-arms and mini C-arms, which is typical for any surgical facility just for localization and understanding visualization. Um, there, we haven't, truthfully, we haven't worked through where that would be, but that would be something that we would work through with the physicians that are credentialed at the Collaborative Surgery Center um, to ensure that there is timely access, of course, to the radiologic procedures that are necessary for diagnostic purposes. Um, currently, there are multiple independent physicians who work um, or who pro provide um, outpatient surgical services at Green Mountain um, that you utilize University of Vermont Medical Center, um, Northwest Medical Center, and all the other various Copley, um, all their imaging departments for their diagnosis um, needs prior to booking or performing their surgery. So it is utilizing um, other hospital sources in their radiology outpatient departments. Um, yeah, understanding those relationships um, can be insightful. And, and of course, given the procedures that you're planning to do, um, the vast majority require imaging. And so um, that's going to be a big component of this. Um, my second question, um, I, I want to understand the facility fee that we've discussed a few times already. There were um, part of your presentation was to show um, the, the Medicare fee um, versus your, the Medicare reimbursement fee for hospitals versus ambulatory care. Um, and there was there was a slide about the Green Mountain Care Board's analysis last year with commercial payers, but I wanted to ask a little bit more about commercial the commercial side because you're estimating that over 50 percent of of your patient volume will be commercial payers, and and how will you be able to maintain your um, cost advantage? How will you know your facility fees? are on the lower side in the in the area among commercial payers. So a lot of um, a lot of commercial payers, um, a lot of um, to Miss Lunge's point, Blue Cross Blue Shield being one of the major payers in the state of Vermont. Um, but those payers such as Aetna and Cigna are based off the Medicare fee schedule. So in a relative system of percentage of Medicare for those payers that are based off Medicare, of course, if you're starting with the lower rate that um, is shown from our example on our PowerPoint of the ASC fee schedule, that relative percentage increase for commercial that we've spoken about of whatever percent that may be would, of course, be that relative savings to commercial and HOPD setting. When it comes to Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, speaking on a level of um, just experience personally with Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, as spoken about earlier, they do not contract based on the CMS website um, and their fee schedule. They do it on an individual basis, which, um, you know, of course, is quite time consuming as um, but it's it's what it's what works for them. And they do that in a way that makes sure that um, our we are not being reimbursed higher than a hospital 
Um, and so that does assist in ensuring that our price is lower than the outpatient services that are offered in the hospital setting. Um, so it is on a fee by fee basis that we contract out directly with a Blue Cross Blue Shield rep for that large commercial payer portion. Okay. Um, that's Liz, I would just add to that. Um, Please go sorry. ahead. Sorry. I, I would just add to that and say that, um, you know, MVP and Blue Cross Blue Shield did write letters of support um, for our application. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Vermont, while they are local to Vermont, um, is part of the broader Blue Cross Blue Shield network nationally. And all payers nationally, Blue Cross Blue Shield, United, Aetna, MVP is regional, but they understand surgery centers. There are, um, you know, it is a big um, care provider um, part of the uh, healthcare industry throughout the country. And they expect that prices at surgery centers will be well below prices at hospitals. And that's where their negotiating starts. So mm -hmm. um, the, the payers themselves ensure on a commercial level that the prices are in line with other surgery centers as opposed to with hospital-based prices. Great, thank you for clarifying. I just wanted to, um, in a value-based environment, moving more toward that, I'd like you to, um, be able to maintain your advantage and understanding your plans for cost allocation and monitoring your costs in order to be able to succeed in those arrangements. I think um, it's an important thing and I couldn't quite understand. Typ typically the commercial reimbursement or commercial payments are proprietary and I wasn't sure how you were going to be able to um, know, maintain your the advantage that you're talking about. So uh, thank you for clarifying where you're at uh, with that. Um, next, I, I'd like to turn to my last question with, um, it's with the CON standard 1.6 about collecting and monitoring quality and outcome data. Um, and Ms. Hunt mentioned earlier, it, it seems like you have more going on um, with quality improvement than I saw in the application. Um, you talk about maintaining the ability to assess um, as required by Medicare, but again, kind of think forward in a more, uh, as we move more toward a value-based environment. Can you say some more about your plans for collecting outcome measures, analyzing those, um, and, and how do you see that changing um, over the uh, near term? In regards to um, CMS, there is, um, I'm sure you're well aware that there is ASC specific quality measures reported by um, by ASCs to CMS um, for benchmarking purposes. There's also the ASC QR, um, which is another benchmarking um, benchmarking criteria that's met. And um, those are things that we have instituted here at Green Mountain Surgery Center that I fully intend to do at Collaborative Surgery Center. I think that it's vital to understand what your quality standards are to a national basis. Um, the nice thing about those benchmarkings is you can hold yourself up to comparison of like surgery centers, all surgery, you can sort down to really understand, um, to get a better understanding and then have a better high level look at how things are operating and where you see that there is um, room for improvement. Um, I'm sure you're also aware that there is um, the percentage increase to your CMS fee schedule that is um, accounted for with this benchmarking and the, and the outcome of outcome variance of your benchmarking. Um, so that is something that we strive for at Green Mountain Surgery Center, of course, um, to always make sure that we are meeting or exceeding um, any level of care and all of their quality measures. Um, and that's something that we pay attention to consistently. Um, internally, we make sure that we have multiple sources within our QAPI and our EOC groups um, working towards quality improvement plans. Um, and it's forward thinking. It's not issues that have come up yet, but it's just main maintenance to make sure that we aren't ever falling behind. Um, I think that the redundancy in that system is very important and that's something that I will institute at Collaborative Surgery Center to ensure the quality of care doesn't lack. Um, I appreciate the more detail and um, that's what I'd like to see with the response to the, that question is, is um, 
you understand what quest what the quality the existing quality requirements are and have a plan for collecting them analyzing them and distributing them in the center um, and have that a bit more spelled out because it's difficult right it, re it requires time and it requires effort um, and it might be wise to have dedicated staff for it, a quality director or, or something of the sort. Um, perhaps you're already doing it sufficiently, but I couldn't tell from the application. Um, sure. I just didn't see a budget for it. Um, and th the trend is also toward more patient reported outcomes. And you talked earlier about the surveys that you're doing. That seems like you're building the infrastructure for those type of outcome measures. Um, but I'd, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more detail of, of how you plan to do those going forward. Right now, what I read just said you're going to meet the existing requirements. Um, so um, sharing more of what you're already doing would be helpful. Sure, um, a couple things there. Um, one of the things that we do internally, and I I appreciate um, the need for quality and someone, um, a, a person in the role of quality and compliance. Um, personally, I wrote a, quite a lengthy paper on the importance of that um, in undergrad, and I understand that completely. Um, that is something that in order for us to remain nimble and to maintain our low cost and overhead as we've all seen on our balance sheet um, for personnel costs. There are redundancy in roles that occur at ASCs, so we can't just have, you know, of course, I would love to have a quality and um, a quality person in place. Um, currently at Green Mountain Surgery Center, that falls on to a nurse manager who completely encompasses that, and I'm part of that team as well with the quality reporting. Um, and then the outcome variance we have, and I'm sorry, I did not I did not explain this well in the application, but an outcome variance um, that we have is um, monthly having physicians report to us on every single patient that was seen in the within the surgery center. They go in and they follow up with anything. Was there a hospitalization? Was there an ER visit? Was there a follow up phone call? Was there um, unexpected pain that occurred? Um, and they allow that to. Um, it's part of our procedures or part of our policies to have a physician perform here to report that monthly. Um, and that is something that we do in house. And that again, I fully intend to have, I believe that it's incredibly important for us to have full um, transparency into that next door, um, especially without having um, employed physicians. So it allows that transparency level that you would see in an employee physician setting, um, and then we can follow up with um, the necessary parties, whether it's the doctor, the admitting doctor, or um, the patient themselves, or whoever it may be, to ensure what the outcome variance was of the patient, to ensure that we fully understand um, how their level of care was suited and how it was postoperatively. Mm -hmm. um, that's terrific. Thanks for the added information. Um, developing the ability to aggregate those outcomes and learn and rather than one by one, looking at it in, in, in totality would be, it'll just be required in the future. Um, yes. Thank you for uh, answering my questions. I'll turn it back um, to Mr. Barber. Thank you. Okay, and last, uh, Mr. Chair, do you have questions? Thank you, Mike. Um, it's always good to go last because a lot of the questions get uh, answered and I've been trying to scribble off anything that's been answered, whether through a previous question or in your testimony today. And so hopefully I won't be repetitive, but forgive me if I am. Um, as far as um, the um, fees and charges related to physician services, will they be billed? through the Collaborative Surgery Center or will they build, be billed by the physicians themselves? The physicians themselves. And do you have any type of um, agreement with them that would mirror the type of charity care that you discussed with um, the healthcare advocate? Not, not formally, no. I mean, you you heard the process that I think it was Liz that explained um, that there is a handoff of the information to the surgeon, um, and you know the explanation of the charity care policy and so forth. 
we haven't discussed anything beyond that. It might be good to at least have a conversation so that uh, the monitors aren't left behind in this uh, scenario. Um, you talked about lowest cost, but I think you did uh, qualify it um, several times. Um, we've seen in the past where people have claimed to be lowest cost that um, oftentimes they weren't, that in fact um, critical access uh, hospitals were the, the lowest cost, just a couple of them. And I'm just curious if uh, you believe that you will be lower than um, all hospitals or or just UVM. Um, I think um, it's it's really still not possible to know what the cost is at all hospitals for all procedures without knowing exactly which procedures the surgeons that will recruit are going to be doing and then what the price is at every hospital. It's really impossible to guarantee that we'll be lower than every hospital. We'll certainly make efforts um, to the. I'm sorry, I think you froze, Ms. Cooper. About pricing. We will certainly make efforts to. to through our conversations with pairs and the way that we think about um, our costs and setting our prices um, to ensure that we are delivering um, substantial savings based on. Um, the care being delivered in hospital outpatient departments, but we can't guarantee because um, we don't have the information available to be able to guarantee um, that we would be lower than every hospital on every procedure. But I, I would like to remind the board that um, we're talking about the cost for the actual procedure and there's still the issue of ancillary charges that hospitals can and do charge that ASCs will not. So there will be savings from that, certainly. So likewise with the previous question, is there any type of uh, agreement with the physicians who are providing services that um, their charges will be less? Or will they be the same regardless of the setting? Typical, um, typically, if you were to look, refer to that CMS um, fee schedule that we've been referring to kind of as a cost basis for a lot of our analysis um, that's used widely to compare HOPD to ASCs, the physician's fee for those um, are typically identical um, based on the CMS reimbursement. I mean, Susan, you can speak to um, just from my experience running um, Health First, the independent physician network. Um, the physicians don't have power, a lot of power over setting their rates with the commercial insurers here. The commercial insurers decide what the community rates are and tell the physicians what they'll be paid by and large. I mean, Susan, you can comment if that's different. Right, and it's typically quite a bit less than mm -hmm. hospital employed physicians. Okay, um, okay. Um, member Pelham asked several questions about the uh, ownership and uh, it is somewhat confusing at this point because of the uh, filings at the Secretary of State, but who do you understand the principles to be um, for the landlord entity that you will be dealing with and what's their other experience and development? Uh, Mr. LaRosa, you're on mute, I believe. Can't hear you. So. Um, as I understand it, LR and W held an interest in this property has two condominium units, unit one and unit two, and this is LR and W held uh, rights over the unit two. Colchester Real Estate Company had, whose principal was Taylor Harmeling, had rights over, had an option instead of exercising that option or in the process of exercising that option it proceeded to purchase out the shares and interest of LR and W. And now Mr. Harmeling is the primary uh, owner with additional investors of this property and has confirmed that the terms and condition of the letter of intent are part of the purchase out of LR and W. 
and CREC. So CREC was closed out and our principal will be a new special purpose entity with Taylor Harmling as the member. So just to be clear, there is a cross relationship between landlord and tenant. No. Well, I'm not talking about uh, ownership interest, but I, I think there probably is a relationship interest is what the point I'm trying to make. Yes, Mr. Harmling and Miss Cooper are married. Correct. Just so that's on the record. Yes. Um, you know, like everyone else, I'm thrilled that you're uh, talking about 50% uh, of the profits going to such worthy causes. But of course, I also worry um, what type of constraints could be placed to make sure that there uh, are profits. So I'm curious about um, what type of promises have been made to um, owners to guarantee them a return and also what time of what type of commitments are there to make sure that management fees and salaries don't eat up any potential profits? So aside from the obligations to pay your rent, um, which obviously is, you know, contractual obligation, I'm not aware of any other promises that would be made or have been made and certainly would, <laughs> as the lawyer inside me, stress that none are being made. Uh, to guarantee profits, uh, to guarantee profits to investors or or anybody else. As to the you know management side, I'll let Susan, Amy, or Liz speak to that. Um. Uh, we have the budget. Um. We have the budget for the personnel that will be running the center. Um, that's based on good comparisons. Um, so we think that will be the budget. We think that um, the center will generate a profit. Um, you know, it's typical in um, ASC arrangements throughout the country for a management company. Um, and there are several large ones in the country to um, to put up upfront money to build the surgery center, then they own half of it and receive half the profits and the physicians who are operating there own half of it and receive half the profits. Um, so we think that in terms of physician expectations, the physicians expecting to own a minority share of the center and have 50% of the profits go somewhere else will be a normal expectation. We think that we would be competitive in um, having physicians see this as they would an ASC opportunity in any other state. But what we're just doing here is replacing the um, sort of national management company who helps set things up and um, help front the costs with, um, with ownership profits going, not ownership, but profits going, committed to be going to a foundation um, and all of the stuff that would normally be done by the management company, we think that between Susan and Liz and myself as a consultant, we can provide that um, guidance. We can um, provide the um, templates around um, policies and ways to do things because we have that experience already having built a successful surgery center. So I hope that helps give some color on why, um, while this is different and innovative, um, having only half the profits of a surgery center available um, for the physician owners is, is somewhat normal in a different way throughout the industry. Okay. And one last question um, for Mr. LaRosa. You said that uh, $37 was uh, typical for the Colchester area. And the way I understand this deal, um, it's the remainder of the $64 that uh, is paying for the fit up or, of all the space. Is $37 typical for a space that has no leasehold improvements? I'm sorry, what? Is $37 typical for a space that has essentially raw space pre fit up? 
Right. I mean, I think you're. I think you can get even higher rates than that at um, like warehouse space. It's. I mean, recently warehouse space down the road at exit 16, which is this area, is going for even higher rates. So that's the best I can offer it. Um, 740 Hercules Drive, which I think is just up the road, is was like eighty dollars a square foot recently for raw warehouse space. I think I'm turning into my grandfather when I think that prices are too high. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it, I mean, look, it's hard to build things and, and there's not a lot of space. Okay. Those are all the questions I have, Mr. Barber. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I have one follow-up, if I may. Sure. Um, Chair Mullen asked about um, the, the commercial uh price negotiations and i was into and i was wondering if you were anticipating that the collaborative surgery center if approved and gmsc might negotiate separately or together with blue cross or other payers that allow for negotiation separately thank you okay um instead of moving to public comment at this point i think it might make sense to talk about um, post hearing, uh, whether there's any follow up or um, any any additional written material, be that briefs or, or written follow up. Um, I did hear a couple questions uh, that I think board members were looking for uh, some additional information around the real estate deal potentially around Medicaid rates, things like that. Um, and I think it might make sense for the board to put that in writing um, and get that to you guys because we don't have a transcript yet and won't probably for at least a couple days. So um, does that sound reasonable that the board would uh, issue some limited questions that that arose out of this hearing that needed follow up uh, and get, get responses pretty quickly from you guys. Well, it's the board's decision. Um, you know, we'll do what the board wants. OK. So unless I hear any disagreement from board members, I think. That's the easiest way to do this. Um, and then the next question uh, is whether either party feels like there's a need to um, submit a post hearing brief. Uh, I, at this point, I think that's unnecessary, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. Yeah, we don't, I, at least on behalf of the CSC, I don't, I don't think we really intend to submit one. I don't think there's legal issues that need to be substantially briefed. I mean, there may be some fact questions I suppose that the board wanted follow up on, but that's not really briefing. And the HCA, do you agree? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, we do plan to submit a written brief, but I believe that some of the questions that we have will likely be answered um, by the CSE if the board submits questions that came up during the hearing. Okay, and what? Um, let's talk about the timing of that brief. Then, when were you thinking that would be filed? I mean, we can be flexible. Um, I'm happy to work with the CSC and the board to come up with a good timeline. But um, as sooner as easier, um, which I would expect to move things along. I know that this is a long process already, um, so happy to do it this week if that's um, beneficial. Sorry, did you say this week? I did, yep. Uh, yeah, I think that, I mean, that would be appreciated if you could submit that by the end of the week, uh, or at least no later than Monday. And then, Mr. LaRosa, you're welcome to 
submit something to. Uh, sounds like that's not of interest. I understand that. Uh, and then the board will get out a set of limited follow up questions probably early next week. That works for us. Yeah, we can do it by Friday. OK, then at this point, um, we'll move to public comment unless there's anything else from either party. OK, so if you have a public comment um, to make, please raise your hand on the Teams app. Um, I see start with Ham Davis and then go to Rick Dooley. Thank you, Michael. Um, I don't have any questions for the applicant. I've got some questions for a combination of the board and the staff. The first one is when the original Green Mountain, the, uh, the Green Mountain Care Board, the Green Mountain Surgery Center was open, um, it was uh, a for profit. At the time, there was talk about how many. I'm sorry, Mr. Davis, you're cutting out a little bit. I think somebody's shuffling papers or something. I, I'm sorry. Um, That's okay. Yeah, in, in, the, uh, in the original discussions about the uh, Green Mountain Surgery Center, there was a, there was a question that raised uh, so how many um, how many of the large number of uh, ambulatory surgical centers in the United States were for profit as opposed to non profit. Does Donna Jerry have still have that number? I don't know him. Um, this is not really an opportunity to ask questions of board staff for, for this kind of hearing. Um, that, then I'll ask, you know that number? You know that number? I don't know that number. Okay, is that, that's that's a question, and I think that's an important question. Um, is there any way that the board would answer it? Yeah, so this, not I, it's, sorry if I'm, I wasn't clear at the beginning. This is a opportunity for the for public comment, um, not not really questions. Ham, so I'm just gonna ask you to keep it to comments. I can't ask question. Okay. <laughs> wow, that's new. Um, the uh, the question. One of my questions is, um, well, I'm not supposed to ask questions. I'll forget it. I'm done. Okay, we'll move to Rick Dooley. Uh, thanks so much. Um, I just want to, I know this is, is a certificate of need um, uh, hearing, and so I just want to just sort of reiterate the need with a patient experience that I had actually um, just this week or evolving into this week. Um, I just want to share this with the board to give a little perspective. So I had a gentleman who had a rectal fissure, a young gentleman, as you can imagine, rectal fissures are very, very painful. I hope that none of you have had the mispleasure of having one, but it's, it's not a pleasant thing. And we've exhausted pretty much everything as an outpatient that we could do. The next treatment is a, is a pretty simple outpatient uh, surgical procedure done by a colorectal surgeon. Um, and I set him up last Friday or Thursday. We tried to get him into colorectal surgery. Um, for what should be a quick procedure and was told that the soonest they can see him and talk about doing this simple outpatient procedure would be um, May, which is a long time from now. Um, their solution is, you know, you can send them to the ER and maybe depending on who's on, they could potentially do it in the emergency room. The gentleman now it's after January 1st, of course, he has a high deductible. So if he goes to the emergency room, it's going to cost him probably two grand out of pocket um, for them to potentially say, we can help you just follow up with the colorectal surgeon folks when they can take care of it in May. Um, so I just want to reiterate to folks that that brings to, you know, brings to home the, the need for high, uh, lower cost, better access, easier access. Those are very real um, concerns for all of our patients. This gentleman is insured, um, you know, with a commercial insurer, but a very high deductible. So, you know, he's not a Medicaid patient or uninsured, but there's a very, very real need for these services in our community. Um, so I just would uh, encourage the board to, you know, keep the patients at your forefront as you're thinking about about the need for these services in our community. Thank you. Thank you. 
I'm not seeing any other hands raised. Is there anyone on the phone? Not on the teams that has a comment? OK, uh, not hearing any other comments, um, but like I said at the beginning of the hearing, um, we will keep the public comment period open for uh, 10 days following this hearing. So if there are any additional comments, um, welcome to submit them to the board. Uh, information about how to do that is available on our website. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mike. Uh, great job running uh, today's hearing and uh, thank you to the applicants. Um, for um, getting us through this process and getting us the information that's uh, required to make a decision. Um, we do have a, a board meeting this afternoon, so I don't see a need to go through old or new business unless any board member has a desire to do that at this time. I see shaking of heads no. So, um, Mr. Hearing Officer, would uh, the proper motion for me just be to um, recess the meeting to one o'clock or would it be to adjourn? Um, no, I think recessing makes sense. So I'm going to recess uh, the meeting of the Green Mountain Care Board until one o'clock this afternoon um, where we'll be talking about different topics. So thank you everyone and have a great lunch hour. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you.